Commission on Human Rights in South Sudan says that human rights abuses are continuing in the country despite the peace deal that is in place. Members of this commission are currently on their seventh mission touring South Sudan, Uganda, Kenya and Ethiopia. CGTN's Patrick Oyet has more. The United Nations Human Rights Commission in South Sudan is visiting camps and settlements for displaced people in the East African countries. It is also meeting government officials in South Sudan. Impunity, of course, is at an all-time high. And many survivors say, why should we actually report these cases? We really don't know what's going to happen. And perhaps it's just fruitless to kind of seek justice. South Sudan's government says it needs support from the international community to build a viable justice system in the country. There is greater need for the provision of access to justice for all and the quest for building effective, accountable, robust and inclusive uh, institutions in our country. The UN, however, is calling on the parties to the peace deal to accelerate implementation. It's important to move forward to the next stage of the peace process uh, because a lot of responsibilities for transforming South Sudan is, is vested or assigned to the revitalized transitional government. The UN Human Rights Commission for South Sudan's mandate includes collecting and preserving evidence of alleged human rights violations and investigating who is responsible for them. It previously listed 43 members of the warring parties for human rights abuses in the country. The commission says it has now added another 23 members of the warring parties to the list of those promoting violation of human rights in the country. However, there might not be any justice unless peace returns to the country. Patrick Koyet, CGTN, Juba, South Sudan. Violence in northern Nigeria is preventing millions of children from accessing quality education. UNICEF says one in every five of the world's out-of-school children is in Nigeria. CGTN's Samson O'Malley reports on how insecurity in the country is impacting the lives of children. It's been 10 years since the Boko Haram insurgency began in northern Nigeria. Violence by herders and farmers who want more grazing field is also on the steady rise in central Nigeria, resulting in huge number of displaced persons. Children in this region have been severely affected as they are unable to go to school. In northeast Nigeria alone, at least 496 classrooms have been destroyed. Activists warn that if the violence continues, children and schools face real threats to their long-term future. Once people are not well informed, people are not well educated, they recycle them into the system that is not uh, admissible for productive engagement. Even economically, it also means that a great number of uh, you, coming up youth will also be disempowered. They will not be able to tap into the global economy. And at the end of the day, is the, the circle of poverty continue and the circle of ignorance also continue. The central challenge is how to give children access to education in areas overrun by violence. You don't just dump them in IDP camp or in resettlement camp or just take them back and dump them. You must be able to recreate a conducive atmosphere for constructive education, for informative education that will also help these people to, 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 to revive their, their life and live a more positive life. One organization is providing free education to internally displaced children, as well as accommodation and access to health care and food. We care for them like we care for our children. We supply all their needs. We, you know, buy their uniforms. We, we buy, we make their sweaters. They don't pay any school fees. We feed them. Children play after they want to eat some snacks and all of, We do all of that, whatever we do with our children. That is what we do with these children. Despite these efforts, the lack of safe and quality education for vulnerable children in northern Nigeria is threatening the future dreams of these young Nigerians. Samson Omale, CGTN, Joss, Nigeria. Meanwhile, Nigeria, Africa's most populous nation, is a large contributor to deaths arising from air pollution, mainly from the burning of solid fuels like wood and charcoal. As CGTN's Kalechi Emekalam reports, nearly half the population are extremely poor and cannot afford clean energy. 
Nursing mother Alheri Samson sells boiled corn for a living and has done so for the past nine years. Her only cooking sauce is firewood and other combustibles. Alheri vigorously fans the flames to ignite the fire and for her it's the only option she has to put food on the table. Sometimes because of the rain, I bring out rubber and plastic materials to help me increase the flame. I fund the fire so that my coat can cook faster. For Alheri, this is by far the cheapest option, compared to cooking gas that costs nearly 10 times as much. However, it's had a negative impact. We suffer because of this smoke. It bruises our eyes and gives me heartburn, headaches and cutter. I was admitted last time in hospital because of the smoke, but it's the only way I can cook my corn. The World Health Organization estimates that about 8 million people die prematurely from air pollution related diseases linked to cooking. And children are the worst hit. 50% of children who die from pneumonia are as a result of particles in household air pollution. The situation is worse here in Nigeria, a country with some of the most polluted cities. It's pretty hazardous, as in, as in it's, it's, it's life-threatening. In Nigeria here, we burn virtually everything burnable, even things that shouldn't be burnt. You know, um, it's a problem of energy accessibility energy availability because don't forget that access to energy is an important it's a critical need of a human being you know because um, uh, uh, people need energy to cook with a negative impact posed on health and environment many here hope the authorities would develop a quick action plan that would make clean energy readily available especially to people like alheri whose lives and businesses largely depend on it. Kelechia Mekalam, CGT in Abuja, Nigeria. Let's go to Cote d'Ivoire now, where at least 30% of the country's mangroves have been wiped out over the past 40 years. Well, now the West African nation is seeking to protect its marine life and save its fast-disappearing mangroves. CGTN's Wilkista Nyabwa reports. 150 kilometers from the Ivorian capital Abidjan lies Lahuk Panda, a mangrove rich area. Here, women burn the wood collected from the mangroves to make the much beloved smoked fish. The mangrove forests are, however, being reduced to mere bushes due to unregulated chopping of the trees. Marie Kua is a fish smoker who uses mangrove wood to smoke her sedins, but is currently staring as the fish stocks dwindle. This year, we bought the wood for nothing. The fishermen go to the sea and come back empty-handed, and we're very hungry. We don't know what we're going to do, but luckily we had a little bit of fish to smoke today. Otherwise, the situation is very hard for us. Local authorities and environmentalists are warning against the age-old practice of smoking fish due to its effects on the fish stock. People started cutting the mangroves under which the fish reproduce. They used to do it in the forest and no one would see them do it. Then they started coming over to the village and started cutting the mangroves. And when authorities realized that people were destroying everything, they made it illegal and have been telling us not to cut the mangroves. Mangrove swamps provide a thriving nursery for various marine species, which would normally not be found elsewhere. The United Nations estimates that Côte d'Ivoire has lost around 10,000 hectares of mangroves every year, falling from 30,200 hectares in 1980 to 9,900 hectares in 2000. What we currently need is around 400 to 450 million US dollars to take charge of the whole of the African continent's Atlantic coast. But at the level of individual countries, a few million dollars should be enough to restore and rehabilitate the ecosystems of the degraded mangroves. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization, 
Africa lost 500,000 hectares of mangroves over a 25-year period. Although deforestation has slowed down since the 80s, Cote d'Ivoire could lose all of its mangroves unless drastic action is taken to stop the destruction. Wilkesangabwa, CGTN. African Americans are visiting Ghana in their numbers as the country marks the year of return in memory of 400 years since the first slave ship landed in Virginia. An African American professor, uh, Tani Sanchez from Los Angeles, went on a heritage tour with her daughter to honor her ancestors and find her roots. Here's CGTN's Wilkes Danyabo with her story. They have gone to Ghana in search of their roots. Professor Tani Sanchez and her daughter Tani Sylvester are making this trip in honor of Sanchez's great-great-grandmother, Mary Ann Moss, who was born into slavery in Alabama around 1838. Moss was married to a black Union soldier named Charles Wright. DNA testing showed a direct link between Wright and the Ashanti ethnic group in Ghana. And now as she listens to the drum beats welcoming her to Ghana, Sanchez weeps. This is her homecoming. I feel much more connected and I look at people and I say, oh my goodness, um, you know, that could have been, these people could be related to me. These people probably knew my grandmother's grandmother's grandmother. I mean, it just, it blows me away. Sanchez spent a long time researching her ancestry, a quest which she compiled into a published book. In such cases, historians often reach dead ends due to a lack of personal records. It was genetic testing that gave Sanchez and others like her hope that DNA could shed light on their family's long-lost origins. Now she hopes to locate the exact family that she belonged to. During the ceremony, she met Ashanti chief Nana Boakye and asked him if he could do a genetic test to find out if they share any genetic links. He agreed. For Sanchez's 40-year-old daughter, the visit to Asin Manso River, where slaves took a final bath before imprisonment on the coast, was a transformative experience. We're retracing the footsteps of our ancestors, like, uh -huh. exactly. I mean, there's something, it's, it's impact, like, it, there's something healing about that. They also visited the harrowing Cape Coast Castle, where slaves were chained and organized into dungeons before walking through the door of no return to board the ships. Thinking of the same route they took and how they must have felt going to a new world and not really understanding anything. And here I am 400 years later and I'm free. So for me, like this whole trip has been about holding my head up high, being bold and courageous and honoring them because they paved the way for me. When the tour ends, they will return to the United States, but this, they are convinced, is home. Bulkis Anyabwa, CGTN. And time for your business news now with Uche. Thanks, Lindy. And coming up on Africa Live Biz. Nigerian lender GT Bank rolls out its expansion plans in East Africa. And Zambia is seeking for a new investor for the troubled Concola copper mine. Africa is the nexus of enterprise, and global business will tell you why it matters. From the mega investment projects to multi billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Africa today collects, just in terms of revenues from taxes alone, $545 billion a year. If you take 10% of that and you devote it to the energy sector, problem solved. All this on Global Business, weekdays at this time on CGTN. Africa Live. Find your voice. Let's start off in Nigeria, where Guarantee Trust Bank is planning to expand into East Africa. Now, GT Bank has already established its units in Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, and Tanzania. It now aims to consolidate its reach in the region. 
GT Bank is one of West Africa's largest lenders with more than 200 branches in 11 countries. The CEO, Shegun Akbaje, has hinted on possible acquisitions in the expansion plans. Now, the bank has posted positive regional performance and profit margins, but it may face challenges from Kenyan competitors such as Equity Bank and Kenya Commercial Bank. Meanwhile, Zambia is planning to get a new and credible investor for Concola Copper Mines. The process will, however, start after the court finalizes on the liquidation of the mine. There has been a dispute between the government and Vedanta Resources, which of course operates the mine since May this year. Vedanta Resources is opposed to the government's decision to appoint a liquidator to run the mine. State-owned mining firm Zambia Consolidated Copper Mines Investment holdings owns about 20 percent of Concolo copper mines while the rest of the shares are held by Vedanta resources president Edward Lungu is this week meeting with the chairman of Vedanta resources Anil Agarwal to discuss the disputed liquidation but the government's position has not changed just yet Meanwhile, South African consumer price inflation dropped from 4.5% in June to 4% in July. That's, of course, lower than economists' median expectations and also the lowest reading since March 2018. Now, this is despite a 10.4% electricity price increase in July. Here's CGTN's Angelo Coppola with more. For cash-strapped South Africans, a moderation in food price inflation from 3.2% in June to 3% in July was welcomed. However, the cost of food production was up by around 5.7% in June. I'm not seeing prices coming down. Like, just going into a store which is only like 500 rands, you walk out with a few items. You know, uh, as much as inflation has incre uh, decreased, um, VET rate is still 15% and that still puts a high price on the products that we buy. I'm not seeing any difference. Uh, things are expensive and it's just, yeah, survival of the fittest. The central bank said it expects headline inflation to average around 4.4% this year and 5.1% in 2020. Given the inflation outlook, analysts say that the Saab is not expected to make any changes to its lending rates over the next 12 months. We're not going to notice a difference in our shopping baskets. We're also not going to notice a difference in restaurant prices when we go out to eat. We're not going to notice a difference in petrol prices. Um, it doesn't get passed down to the consumer. Um, we're just going to be paying more um, and not less every month. And based on the central bank's view on the limited value of reducing interest rates as a tool to stimulate the local economy, there is also no real possibility of seeing any interest rate changes anytime soon. While the most recent inflation number is lower than expectations, people still aren't on the streets or buying anything because they have less disposable income. I'm Angelo Coppola for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. Now, Kenyan telecom giant Safaricom says it has achieved 50% share of female employees on its payroll. This comes amid an increase in the number of direct and indirect jobs, which it sustained in the last financial year, growing 9% to 979,000. This, of course, is according to the Telco's 2019 Sustainable Business Report, which was released on Thursday, in which the firm also announced a plan to plant 5 million trees in in the next five years as part of a carbon offset program now in the year under review the firm says 178 women-owned businesses were pre-qualified under its women in business initiative the firm supports 167,083 mpesa agents 433 dealers 1138 suppliers and 4503 permanent employees as well as other stakeholders now the company had a staff headcount of 6323 as at march 2019 an increase from about 6130 in 2018 and moving on now, two of America's biggest store chains recently announced they will have to raise prices if new tariffs on Chinese goods are implemented. Now, economists are saying that this will hit lower-income Americans the most. Here's CGTN's Karina Huber with more from New York. Walmart, the world's largest retailer, recently warned prices at its U.S. stores will likely rise. In May, its chief financial officer said, our goal is to be the low-price leader, but increased tariffs will increase prices for consumers. 
Macy's is also warning of possible price hikes ahead. The alerts came after the Trump administration increased tariffs on $200 billion worth of Chinese imports from 10 to 25 percent, and as it threatened tariffs on an additional $300 billion worth of goods, essentially all Chinese imports not already hit. Research by a group of leading economists published during the Obama administration suggests lower income Americans are the hardest hit by tariffs. Their report says the burden of tariffs is five times as heavy for the bottom tenth of households as for the top tenth. That's because lower income groups tend to use more of their take home pay to cover basic needs and they tend to buy more low cost imports. I mean, why should prices rise? Just because of a trade. I mean, it has nothing to do with any of us has everything to do with politics and the government. Right, raise prices on the clothes, like, that makes people not want to go and shop at Macy's just because of that. Retailers like Macy's are in a tough position. They may need to raise prices to cover increased costs, but they don't want to raise prices too much or they could lose business. Karina Huber, CGTN, New York. Now, Tanzania's airline coastal aviation organization has launched a green campaign in order to try and offset the impact on the environment. Here's CGTN's Daniel Kijo with a story. Coastal aviation specializes in flights into Tanzania's top tourist destinations. Now it's launched a Go Green campaign to reduce its impact on the environment. So we're partnering with Wild Aid. We're partnering with Carbon Tanzania to create some great impact to actually drive uh, people's conscience to, for carbon offset and create that behavior. Coastal says it can offset its carbon emissions with this partnership. Carbon Tanzania is an organization which works on natural forest conservation. Airlines are major contributors to emissions worldwide due to the large amounts of fossil fuel needed. Nearly 4 billion passengers will fly on airplanes worldwide this year. Those journeys account for nearly 3% of all global carbon emissions. This airlines hope that others will follow its example and reach new heights by going green. Meanwhile, its partnership with WildAid supports conservation activities to protect the animals their customers fly to see. Many environmentalists claim the best way to reduce the impact of the aviation industry would simply be to reduce the amount of flights people take. But Coastal hope it can make a difference to the environment and also its brand. And also it's going to attract more customers in terms of tourism to use their airlines because they, know, they show that they are doing uh, tourism in a responsible way. Coastal has also stopped providing single-use plastic water bottles on flights, saving about 16,000 bottles of plastic waste per month. It's also reducing printing and using LED lighting. At the moment, it's, uh, it's uh, Coastal that are choosing to pioneer in Tanzania. We're really proud to be that. That's the legacy that Coastal has always been. So we're really proud to be doing this stuff. We hope all of the other carriers will follow suit because ultimately that's saving our world. And if Coastal's climate plan takes off, other airlines may follow suit. Daniel Kijo, CGTN, Dar es Salaam. Now, Denmark's Lego is investing 150 million US dollars until 2030 in order to create bricks that are not harmful to the environment. Its first plant based components were released in 2018, but now the company is introducing an eco friendly set which has got Lego fans going gaga. Here's CGTN's Julie Shire with more. For years, this is what Lego bricks have looked and felt like. These building blocks have kept children entertained for generations. The much-loved toy brick company is now trying to save the planet, one little piece at a time. Lego released its first plant-based kit just weeks ago. It's made up of 3,000 pieces, and all of the botanical features are made from eco-friendly plastic. So this is the Lego Ideas Treehouse that was released internationally on the 1st of August. And you can see that all of these top elements, um, which in the set are leaves, but are actually made out of cane and are completely biodegradable. And there are more plant elements around the set and even here in some of the detail of the set. Lego produces billions of components every year, which travels to over 40 markets. It's hoping to transform its production line in the next 10 years. So Lego's strategy by 2030 is to have all of their components that we use to build um, the sets with um, completely sustainable by the year 2030. And by the year 2025, to have all packaging 
and elements of the packaging completely sustainable and biodegradable. Lego is an important learning tool for millions of children. It's an equally fun hobby for adults. But don't throw away the iconic blocks just yet because they still fit perfectly with the new components. I think it's a very clever idea because it doesn't harm anyone or anything. It's very creative and, and if you forget um, how to build it, you can just think of a new idea. Plastic Lego bricks have been around for 50 years. They are passed down through generations and seldom end up in landfill sites. But should one of the new eco-friendly blocks land in the trash, it will disappear a lot sooner than plastic. Julie Shara, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. Well, that's all for now on Africa Live Biz, but ahead on Global Business Africa, Egypt's central bank cuts its interest rates for the first time in six months. We'll be analyzing the impact of the decision on its economy. Of course, all that coming up top of the hour for now. Back to you, Lindy. Thanks, Uche. Well, do stay with us. Here's what's still ahead on Africa Live. Coming up, we see how two master mime artists in Egypt are saying it all without a word. Join us in global business and see Africa through our eyes. Africa Live. Find your voice. We start in Egypt now, where two performing artists tell the story of man's evolution, but through a form of silent theater, miming. The pair are hoping to bring an alternative visual experience to Cairo's audiences. CGTN's Daniela Pearson has more. 19-year-old Abdullah Walid and 22-year-old Abdul Rahman Al-Qadi aren't just Egyptian university students. They're students of the silent art of miming. Using only their striking facial expressions and their bodies, the pair performs together under the name Silhouette. At the Zawiya Cinema in downtown Cairo, their latest work, Creation, tells the story of man's evolution and the contrast between primitive man and modern man. It tells of the story of the primitive human and how he used to deal with nature, how he used to respect and appreciate it, how he used to interact with the creatures and everything else around him. The performance also shows how man has lost connection with nature. Instead, modern man is trapped in a never-ending daily routine. He goes round and round in it not taking a single moment to take pleasure in anything. He's always critical and upset, and never interacts with the natural world around him, as opposed to the primitive human being. The independent artists have performed at a variety of venues, telling a series of different stories. But beyond the performance, Walid and Kadi are hoping to reshape the public's impression of their silent art form. In our current time and especially in Cairo, people see mime and pantomime as something that can make them laugh and an art for young children. People have confused mime artists with clowns. So this has annoyed us because people are saying we are doing something we are not, giving us a false image. We spent a long time doing this. This art once had its audience. People acknowledged it as an art. We are now trying to correct people's image of this art, presenting it in a way that is fit for it, because it takes a lot of effort for it to be properly presented and for people to start watching it and trusting it as an art form. Walid and Kadi have great aspirations for the art of miming. But while delivering their performance, the pair are also reminding today's technology-driven youth of the importance of breaking one's routine and getting in touch with nature once again. Daniela Pearson, CGTN. Time for a short break. Your sports news up next. Coming up, Cycling South Africa ready for this year's UCI World Masters Championship in Manchester, England. Africa, where champions are made, records are broken, legends are born. 
We're there for every goal, for every knockout, for every step of the way. Match point only on CGTN. Africa Live. Find your voice. Cycling South Africa is gearing up for this year's UCI Track Cycling World Masters Championship in Manchester, England. The event caters for men and women from 35 to 75 years of age. CGTN's Julie Shire has more. Getting ready to make an impact at the UCI Track Cycling World Masters Championship. That's one place there where you can go and compete in your own age categories and be competitive. In South Africa, we race against younger people and that's our only feeding ground or training area. I have to be competitive against a guy that's 10 years younger than I am to be able to be competitive at world's level. These athletes have been selected to represent in either sprint or endurance disciplines and to maintain their momentum, they ride about 200 kilometers a week. It's a different kettle of fish basically because we go over to the 250 meter track compared to our 500 meter track and it's a different style of racing but it is more competitive and it's quite nice to race against your own age group for a change. The championship is self-funded and for cyclists to compete at this event it requires commitment and sacrifices. I think it's the culmination of the effort that you put in and the reassurance that you're able to do it. It's so important that one uses your talent um, whatever that, that might be, and use it to its fullest. Today's Masters cycling team are confident preparations are on track and expectations are high. I'm hoping that I can come as close as possible to a medal, even to improve on South African records or get a South African record would be great. We are blessed enough to win more than once in our lives. At the SA level, we win and we get used to it. Well, it's just a different story. I held three world titles, I have 14 world championship medals and in 2014 I missed the gold by 0 0.066 of a second. So my expectation this year is to go and to, to make sure we right, we right that wrong. The bottom line is you've got to get it right on the day. The Manchester Velodrome is the hotbed for the Masters Track Cycling World Championship and these cyclists will be putting the pedal to the metal in this event. Julie Shah, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. Tributes continue pouring in for former Ghana international footballer Junior Ogogo, who has died at the age of 40 in London. Fan favourite Ogogo scored thrice for the Black Stars in their third place finish at the 2008 Africa Cup of Nations. He sadly suffered a stroke in 2015 and has been battling health issues since. CGTN's Nabil Ahmad Rufai reports from Accra. The former Ghana and Nottingham Forest forward Manuel Junior Agogo died on Thursday in a hospital in London. After playing lower league football in the UK, Agogo earned a call-up to the Black Stars in May 2006. He went on to play for Ghana at the 2008 Africa Cup of Nations hosted by the country and scored 12 goals during his stint with the national team. I saw the news on Facebook. He was a very good player. And yeah, we are sad we lost him at just age 40. If I'm to make mention of his performance in the tournament, he really played well. And he also helped in most of the qualifications in, at most of the stages in the AFCON. So when I heard the news, in fact, this morning, I was not able, even able to take my breakfast at the first place. The Ghana Football Association has also in a tweet said it is saddened by the news of the sudden demise of the ex-Ghana star. Agogo began his youth career at Sheffield Wednesday in 1995 moving up to the senior squad in 1997. He went on to score over 100 career goals, many of them with Bristol Rovers, for whom Agogo scored 45 goals in 140 games between 2003 and 2006. He also helped Nottingham Forest to promotion from League One in 2007-2008, finishing as the club's top goal scorer as they finished runners-up in the division. The Ghana-born player spent time at 15 different clubs, before retiring from professional football in 2012. Nabil Ahmed Rufai, CGTN, Accra, Ghana. Looking ahead now to the English Premier League